Early in the year 1804, Lieutenant Governor David Collins sailed into the Derwent River and moored his ships in one of the loveliest bays which he called Sullivan's Cove. Deep water to the shore formed a wonderful natural harbour, and there was a beautiful site for a town at the foot of Mount Wellington. Old paintings in the Hobart Museum show us how the town looked in its early days. From a tiny camp by the river, Hobart became a thriving port for whaling ships. Luggety little ships like this one plied their trade in the southern seas and returned to the Hobart waterfront with its taverns and warehouses to sell their catch and spend their money. Those early days were roaring times, but now the city is more respectable and peaceful. But still, the people of Hobart are drawn to the waterfront to watch the scallop and other fishing boats return from the channel and the southwest coast. And to see the overseas cargo ships which call in to load Tasmanian apples for the United Kingdom and fine Tasmanian wool for many distant ports. This little port is perhaps one of the friendliest in the world. The ships lie at their berth, not a stone's throw from the centre of the city, their masts rising almost among the buildings. The city itself is a busy place. On the right is the General Post Office in Elizabeth Street. And farther up the main street, is another landmark, the new Commonwealth Bank. The town hall stands by itself in the sunlight facing the post office. It is the center of municipal government. In this building, the Lord Mayor and his aldermen deal with local matters such as city roads and lighting, town water supply, building regulations, food inspection, and planning for the future growth of the city. Members of the City Council are chosen by the ratepayers of Hobart at elections which are held every two years. They have the power to make bylaws to enforce their decisions. Hobart is the capital of our island state, so that it is here by the Derwent that we find Government House. The Governor, who was the Queen's representative in Tasmania, lives here. In Parliament House, the laws of the state are made. New legislation is introduced, usually by the Government in the House of Assembly, and debated there. When it has been approved after three readings, it is sent to the Legislative Council. The Legislative Council, which consists of 19 members of Parliament, has the power to suggest amendments or to reject a bill. When a bill is approved by this Council, it is sent to the Governor for his signature, and it then becomes law. As the centre of state government, Hobart has a great number of administrative buildings. This is the Lands and Surveys Department in Davies Street, where Tasmania's maps are made. In this one, near the Tourist Bureau, we find the Education Department and the Supreme Court. It also contains the offices of the Premier and his staff, with the Attorney General and the Chief Secretary. And this building in Davy Street is where plans are made for all the hydroelectric developments in Tasmania. If we travel up the Derwent from the harbour, we come to the Hobart Bridge, which floats on the water connecting Lindisfarne with the city.
A little farther up the river is the electrolytic zinc works, the largest industrial concern in Tasmania. Ships sail up the Derwent, pass under the lift span of the Hobart Bridge, and at the zinc works they load zinc ingots, superphosphate or sulphate of ammonia. There are also a number of industries grouped in the suburb of Derwent Park. At silk and textile printers, cloths of silk, cotton, rayon and nylon are dyed and printed with lovely designs. Strong chisels are made at the Titan Products factory. In the IXL factory, situated in a splendid position by the wharves, jams and preserves are made from Tasmanian fruit. But there is more to any city than houses, docks, shops and factories. There are the schools, the colourful new schools set in pleasant surroundings. to mellow with time. There is the museum, where examples of many natural and man-made objects are displayed. State Library, where thousands of books are kept for those who want to read for pleasure or to study. And here, on the outskirts of the city, is the Lady Franklin Museum, a gift to the people of Hobart from Lady Franklin. A walk around Hobart will bring us to a number of beautiful old buildings. These stone warehouses in Salamanca Place have seen the passing of many years. While Arthur Circus is almost unchanged since the early days. The Theatre Royal, erected in 1838, was the first theatre to be built in Hobart. On Sundays, 
the tower of St. David's Cathedral vibrates with the ringing of the bells. And here, St. Mary's Cathedral stands amid green lawn. Hobart's first church and cemetery once stood where St. David's Park now provides a peaceful resting place. Many of the old tombstones still remain in the park. Here is that of David Collins, founder of Hobart and Lieutenant Governor of the early settlement. He died when Hobart was six years old. Another monument to his memory marks the place where he and his 260 settlers first landed in Hobart. Another very attractive piece of city parkland is Franklin Square, where stands a statue of Sir John Franklin, an early governor of Tasmania and a famous explorer. Rare plants are grown in the botanical gardens which spread their green reaches almost to the Derwent. On the domain stands the White Cenotaph, a constant tribute to the fallen of two world wars. In all weathers, the mountain is a favourite playground for the people of Hobart. In winter, the snowberries come, and then the snow. And of course, the winter brings the football, a favourite sport in Hobart. In the early summer, when the first warmth has hardly been felt, the yachts are out on the river. Then the beach fills at Sandy Bay during the long golden days. And across the river at Belle Reve, the swimmers cluster just as thickly. This then is Hobart, built on the banks of the Derwent beneath Mount Wellington, the port, the capital, the lovely city. <laughs> <laughs>